on their road to create the next unicorn. Uh, so I'm very excited to, to do that today. I will introduce Klaus, Klaus from Lakestar. Lakestar is one of the leading European business angels, uh, founder of Lakestar. He is or has been involved in like a small company like uh, Facebook, King.com, Skype, Xing, Klarna, Spotify. Dominic from Index uh, joined Index in 2007. Before that, he was running uh, Yahoo for Europe. And Dominic is involved in a lot of uh, big projects too, like Adconion, Criteo, Metapack. And the last one, Philippe Bottery. Uh, who is partner uh, in uh, Axel partner in London office? Uh, he spent 15 years in the US, uh, 10 years in Silicon Valley. So I guess he will uh, give you some uh, secrets coming from this beautiful place. And uh, uh, Philippe is, sits in the board of DocuSign, Halo, and BlaBlaCar with all French uh, uh, unicorn. Uh, in which we are very proud, so we will talk on that after. Uh, the first point before beginning this session is to probably define the, the, the term unicorn. We were spending a little time yesterday with Dominique on the beautiful Crito Terrace and trying to define what is a unicorn. So is it much more in terms of valuation? Is it much more in terms of disruption? So Dominique said to me, but he is an investor. It's a one billion plus. It is a unicorn. I say to him, but probably uh, another vision could be to, Unicode could be something that changed the life of millions of people. So I will just let you. Uh... Yeah, we shouldn't probably spend too much time, but the, there were some definitions that were given. So people who came with the word unicorn refer to billion plus in valuation. And obviously, you should assume that company having read this kind of valuation have a major impact on ecosystem on businesses, on people's life. So the two probably go together. Yeah, thanks, Dominique, for the clarification. Klaus, as you have invested in the most, a uh, lot of exciting unicorn in the world, you sit now in Klarna and sit in Spotify too. You seem to be at the right place at the right moment. What is your secret? At the end, is, I think it's always a little bit luck. Yeah, and uh, it's nothing that you can really plan. You are at the right time, at the right spot, and have the right risk appetite. But in general, if it comes to um, the entrepreneurs that finally build unicorns, they rather come <clears throat> have a technical background, and they discover a problem in their life that they want to sol solve with technology. And out of that motivation, they were probably very enthusiastic. They are full of passion and uh, of tech technology knowledge, and that's how they s tackle the problem, and uh, the likelihood that big companies come out of that is higher than as if people from with an economic background start something. That's good. And, um, Philippe, uh, what is your pred prediction on the next disruption? I mean, we can consider that the next unicorn would be probably something that disrupts uh, an economy, for example, you are, very in, you are involved through the Blabacar experience in the sharing economy, which is very disruptive. And according to your, to your vision and the fact that you spend a lot of time in the Silicon Valley, what is a net disruption? It is in mobile, Bitcoin, big data. What are the, the main trends for Axel at this moment? Well, I, I think you need to look at disruption in, in two ways. I think that the disruption that is already existing and that, that is going to accelerate. And I would put uh, you know, a company like BlaBlaCar in this camp. Um, I mean, today there are 8 million members in 12 countries, they do a million ride a month. When I you know, try to project it and look you know, five, 10 years from now, I mean, this is a, this is a company that could uh, transport you know, dozens of millions of passengers per year. I mean, if you look at the disruption that this, this can bring, not only to France, but now they're in, in 12 countries or around the world, I mean, this is going to you know, change people's lives. And when I look at what is on, on the roadmap and all the things they can do around it, you know, I, I, I think there is uh, you know, something pretty big is going to happen there. Um, I think just overall as trend, I think uh, mobile is, is something that's been really transformation, transformational, um, both in terms of you know, expanding existing offering, but also 
giving birth um, to business models that couldn't exist before. I mean, if you look at a, a lot of the, the, the marketplaces, for example, that are emerging right now, um, that depends on, relies on mobile, couldn't exist, um, you know, five years ago because the platform what was not there. I mean, if, if you look, t take the, the example, uh, so one of my recent investments is a company called Hustle.com, which is a marketplace for home services. Uh, you say, well, where is mobile in, um, you know, booking a cleaner for your house? Well, probably if you're going to book the cleaner for your house, you could probably have a good chance of doing that in front of your computer. But if you want to create a real-time marketplace, the cleaner is going to be cleaning, uh, and it's going to be very hard for the cleaner. I mean, you can't, if the cleaner has to wait to go back home and look at, you know, his or her computer, then that's not going to work. If the, computer, if, uh, the cleaner has a mobile phone, see, uh, has uh, a push message saying, well, here is a job, do you want to accept it or not? And you do that in real time, then you can have someone, you know, you're sitting in front of your computer, but the cleaner can answer in real time. So uh, if you look at this, you know, just in terms of, um, all, I mean, all the services, the marketplace for services and things that are going more real time, more you know, geolocation based, I think there's a huge potential and we're just scratching the surface. Great. Uh, Dominic, it seems that uh, Index have invested a lot in retail industry, I mean, in e-commerce. Do you think that this sector is disruptive enough? So, uh, uh, disruption is, uh, you have waves of, of disruption. It's clear that um, some models have been built in e-commerce that, uh, that are pretty remarkable. Um, one I have in mind, which is probably in the mind of a lot of people in Europe, is ASOS. Um, and what you find is something that is not just commerce, it's a lot more than that. When you're looking at the engagement of the consumers uh, with the site, people who go there every day, it's a, uh, it's a pretty amazing phenomenon. So this was clear disruption. And uh, in your case, uh, Terry, is the, the, you have exactly that. The engagement you're getting from your consumers is something you couldn't have done offline. So this was a first wave. What we see uh, today, there is, uh, for me, a second wave coming, which is around technology uh, to support e-commerce. Uh, we're discussing just before about MetaPack. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a good example. Um, if you're thinking the bar is set by Amazon today, uh, consumer expectations are coming from Amazon experience. And the only way for a lot of e-commerce sites to deliver something on par with Amazon is to rely on people providing technology for them. And that's where we, we found companies like Adyen on the payment side, Metapack on the delivery side. Um, and you will find a lot of very interesting companies. And the change to me, six, seven years ago, merchants were not ready to pay for technology. They were, it was like, let's build, let's do it ourselves. Today, realize that technology can transform the business. So that's a second way for me. Thanks, Dominic. Uh, Close. regarding your portfolio uh, company, it seems that main of your investment are global. Do you think that it's a key to be a unicorn, to be global? And the second question is, can we, can we have a European company that can care the world without being in the US? <clears throat> Um, I, I think at the end, internet is all about scale. And you know, the bigger you are, the lower your marginal costs are. And that has historically been a disadvantage of us because you know, there was a French company fighting against a German company, fighting against a US, UK company, all doing the same stuff. So and everybody got a fraction of the money, everybody got a fraction of the market. And at the same time, there was one US company that was clearly identifiable as a winner early on. So and they came then, attacked Europe with a better financing and with lower marginal costs. So at the end, we didn't have a chance if it came to totally scalable businesses. I think if we uh, team up a little bit better in Europe and get to this, um, the, this big addressable markets earlier on, then there's a likelihood. And um, the history shows, especially in the last years, that with the Rovios, with the Kings, with the Spotify's, with the Klanas, with the Supercells. I mean, the, the, the frequency in which we in Europe produce these kind of unicorns is massively increasing, as is the financing capacity that we can attract. So I think in terms of the development of the ecosystem, yeah, we traveled some light years in the last three, four years. 
um, and therefore I'm pretty confident that infrastructure-wise everything is set that, that, that we can get there. Another aspect is that the gearing of the entrepreneurs has changed. Yeah? The 2000s basically saw national um, uh, entrepreneurs developing companies for the national market and since we had some successes in the 2000s and we created role models of success, people imitated that and now they will get a different scope and also are more courageous to do so. Well, let me just maybe add on that because I have a, s a slightly um, different perspective. Uh, even though, I mean, I agree, if, if your market is global, going global obviously is the best way to, to reach the full potential. Um, but I think it also depends on what, what the market you're, you're addressing. I mean, if you, a company like Showroom Privé, for example, I mean, the market for Showroom Privé in France, just in France, is just a massive opportunity. I mean, you create a unicorn, and, and I think Showroom Privé is one of them, w just in the market of France. Now, you know, you can expand a bit from there, but it's not a requirement to be in the U.S. You know, on, on, the, uh, you know, on the opposite side, if you're Supercell, one of our early stage investment, which become big, you know, very quickly, you know, this market is just a global market. You put your app in the app store and suddenly you have access to a global market. So, of course, you need to do it. Um, you know, another example is a company like, um, you know, PeopleDoc, which is one of our recent French investment. It's a soft, you know, SaaS HR uh, uh, software. For a company like this, obviously you need, you know, in software, you need to be the leader in the US if you want to be a recognized player. So that's a company where you want them to move to the US uh, pretty quickly. So I, I would say it really depends on, on the, you know, your business model and the market that uh, you're, uh, you're addressing. Yeah, and, and can we consider that, okay, in the early stage financing, then now we've got a huge ecosystem, a great ecosystem, especially now in France due to France Digital and, and, and all the energy, which is here today. But when you create a company and then when you, do, uh, when you want to go from 100 million to 1 billion, and then you need potentially to activate some bigger levers. And it seems that more of this kind of round, the 50, 100 million from, are much more close to the West Coast than to the US. What is your point of view on, on that, Dominique? So, I, I can only agree with that. Um, having said that, that's the reason why we started in uh, um, 2007 when I joined a, a growth fund exactly to tackle this topic, which is when company reach 20, 30 million in revenue growing very fast, um, you can, most of the time you probably you, you can reach profitability, so you can have your, uh, you, you control your own destiny but you can accelerate at that point. And some companies want to do it, some companies don't. So when you don't, it's fine. But when you want, you need to find people to help you achieve that. And that's exactly what you're referring to. So we felt like we should, uh, we should do it. Um, but again, the number of companies, uh, to give you a quick example, the first fund was 17 companies. We ended up investing six in the US, one Russia, one Denmark, one Holland, two UK, two France, two Germany, two Italy, one Spain. So showing that there is no uh, single country where there is a high density of this type of company. And even if it seems that at this time, if you look the public market, the valuation seems to be higher in the US than in the Europe, does it could change something in the way to finance this kind of company in their growth uh, activity? Close. <clears throat> yeah, well, first, the public market, I, I would doubt that we really have a public market for internet in, in, in Europe. I mean, if you look at the combined valuation, I think combined market cap internet only in the US is above 750, 800 million. And if you're generous, then in Europe, it's probably like 20 billion. Uh, so I think we don't, we don't have a real culture of, of public market for internet companies. I hope it will come. Uh, and maybe a, a Zalando or a Rocket can break that in Europe. Um, because I think it's a much needed um, sector where we can exit companies that do not want to be associated with the US. Because not everybody can go to the US. If you think about yeah, IPO readiness costs, including all this compliance with Saban Oxley, is easily 10 to 13 million US dollar. Uh, and that at a, at, at, at a decent multiple has already like 200, 300, 400 million market cap that you need to have just for being ready to, to IPO, let alone the daily hassle. So 
I don't think we have these kind of markets at all here. I hope uh, uh, that banks are disciplined enough to not uh, list mediocre companies because then we have the same hassle that we had in the early 2000s uh, with Neuer Markt in Germany and, and, and everywhere. So I think discipline from the banks and some good uh, examples like the, the Rockets or Zalandos hopefully could break this market in Europe. Great. Dominique, I have a question for you. We used to compete in the past when you were in, uh, leading Kelku. Long time. Yeah, a long time ago. I mean, the prehistoire of the internet. Uh, so you have been an entrepreneur. And so my question is, as an old entrepreneur, knowing a little bit, probably uh, more than in KPI, in logistics, marketing, does it help you to target much more the, 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 I mean, the next unicorn and then to help the company to grow? And the other question is, do you consider yourself much more as a financial partner or a service activity? I okay. mean, I mean. Two, two relevant questions. On the first one, a lot of time I make a parallel between running a business and being on, uh, on the investment side. If you're thinking about uh, how you allocate your time, it's all about scaling. And if you're thinking about building a very large company, it's all about scaling. And at the end of the day, the few, very few things scale. There was a quote at the beginning, which is, I, I usually say that a lot, which is, very few things matter, but when it matters, it matters. And the one thing that really matters is people. And if you are running your business, think about, uh, obviously, uh, showing the direction, strategy is important. The second thing, probably as important or even more important, is attracting great talent in your company. Being on the investment side, how can you help a company? help the company bring great talent. So it's very, very similar, and the two help. The other one, what you learn is the same as when you run a business. You don't tell people what to do. You help people think about what to do. And I try to do the same with my uh, CEOs, which is never tell what, but help like a sounding board, uh, help them think. On your second point, uh, which was... I mean are you considering yourself only as a financial or providing much more service yeah. to your entrepreneur? So both, obviously. Um, it, it cannot, it's not just money. Uh, we always say that. Uh, but we, we try to, uh, to do it more and more uh, through technology. So um, when you have a very large network of companies, there is a lot to be shared. Just think about that. Um, in terms of technology, CTOs have a lot to share even if they are not in the, in the same business. So it's not uh, just about providing people to help hire, as example, what we call services, but it's just create, facilitate communication among the companies because there is a lot of knowledge, there is a lot of uh, uh, intelligence there, and if you can facilitate that, and again, same as what I was saying before around people, technology helps you scale. So think service, but think service in a scalable way. That's what we do. That's great. Um, Philip, what are your most important factors when you invest in, the, in a company? What are you looking for? Except, I mean, the team, which is the first response for all VC. Just after that, what is your main point you want to go, in, in which you want to go further? Well, it, of course, as you said, the, the, you know, the, the team is a critical part of, uh, of the investment. But I, I think in, in the team, the, the, the things, because saying the team, of course, but what, what does it mean? I mean, for me, it means, you know, being extremely dedicated, being passionate, and have the right level of, uh, of ambition. Um, so I, I think that's how I would characterize, you know, the thing I'm looking for in the team. Um, then the thing I'm, I'm, I'm looking for in, in a company is you know, a, a product or a service that is really making a difference. Something that is creating economic value uh, or adding significant benefits to the users, be it, you know, a B2B or a B2C service. Uh, because at, at the end of the day, you know, the market, the market we invest in, they, they, don't, they don't exist, right? Because if they existed, then um, uh, if the product that startups are doing already existed, then it wouldn't be a, a, a startup. So it, it's all about understanding how a new product and a new technology can el help change the way people are doing things, the way people think about things, or you know, even people's life, and see if 
it can change life, um, you know, and, and, and add a level of benefit that can help create a huge company and not something that address, you know, a, a, a niche market. So that's how I would characterize it. Great. Klaus, we were talking on the B2C, uh, B2C and B2B uh, investment. It seems that's due probably to the big, big monster like Apple, Google, and, and iOS uh, actors. Do you think that there is still huge room to grow and to create unicorn in the B2C sector? And it seems that on a global um, level, most of the VC at this moment are looking at the B2C activity with a little bit like a little bit of thread. <clears throat> yeah, so I, I think that there will be more B2C companies coming. Um, I think there's, with the duopoly of the two operating systems, there is still a little bit of risk, which is a little bit more than you were before. Before you had a different ad networks or you had different ways how you could advertise. Basically now you are at the, until the last day of the mercy of the two operating systems, which creates which creates a little bit of an, an additional risk and a chance that you can also accelerate. Um, <clears throat> but I think everything goes in waves. And now there's a little bit more, it swings back a little bit to the B2B side. And um, so that, that we, ha we have seen that for several times and it's always a flavor of the month. I mean, it will come back. <laughs> uh, Dominic, do you invest in company that will make the world better? Is me? Uh, Murray, you, you are behind the question. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, I, I, I can only really say yes. It's um, as you uh, making uh, economy more efficient, as you making you creating uh, uh, amazing businesses, you disrupting uh, sleeping uh, sectors. Yes, you're making the world better for sure, more efficient, better different so it's creativity uh, aspect it's uh, uh, it's curiosity so yes uh, th that's what is exciting and to be frank if it was just about doing again what we've done in the past to be really really boring so yes well, the thing is I, yeah. I think it depends for who as well because I, I'm sure millions of people think blah blah car is making their lives better I'm not sure the uh, SNCF thinks uh, the same <laughs> yeah, it depends. point of view different point of view even if uh, SNCF try to do the same service, no? Or they book they booked something, no? Uh, well, Competitor, a, a lot of people have, have tried um, yeah. and failed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Great. And what excites you about the future tech, Philippe? What are the main... Uh, now, this time, what are you reading? Which kind of company you are looking for at this moment? Well, um, that's, a, that's a good question. I mean, I, I think uh, if I look at the, the type of things I'm looking right now, I mean, I'm, I, I think there is, uh, we're seeing more and more, I mean, to get back to what we're saying, a lot more B2B uh, emerging from Europe on the application side. I mean, historically, Europe has been stronger on consumer services, and I think now we're starting to see um, more B2B side, which I, I find uh, very interesting. I mean, PeopleDoc is w w one example of that. Um, so that, that's uh, an area that I'm, uh, I'm looking very closely. I think on, on the consumer side, uh, we're seeing a lot of new marketplaces emerging, you know, trying to you know, disrupt um, different markets. I mean, uh, everyone heard about, uh, you know, La Ruche Kidiwi in, in France. I mean, it's a name that's hard to, to forget, uh, where, you know, they're trying to disrupt the way people access and consume, um, you know, fresh goods. And we're seeing more and more of these, these models where, you know, the first time you look at them, you say, well, how can they scale? And then you look at the number six months later and you say, wow, you know, there's actually a, a pretty big market for it. Um, it's kind of the same thing with Blah Blah Car. It was, you know, who wants to invest in a company doing hitchhiking? No, really, like, you know, when I did the first investment three years ago, it was like, well, you know, this is a small market. And then suddenly you turn it into something different with the power of, you know, internet, of social media, uh, and, and the, different, the, the, the layers of, you know, connectivity and trust that you can put around it, which didn't exist in the past. And I think we'll see a, a lot of services emerging, uh, leveraging the new tools and new platforms that didn't exist and turn things that people thought were, you know, very small for different reasons and, and turn them into very big things. Good. And close, last question. Uh, you invested in Airbnb, no? Airbnb? Yeah. yeah. 
And so do you think that the next big thing will come from the sharing economy? Well, this is such a placeholder notion. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I mean, when I look, when you ask me the question what I'm looking at next, I think that financial services is great. Uh, we should look at it in a closer way for several reasons. First, if publishers were lame to react, yeah, TV was even more lame, but the lamest incumbents are probably banks because they are unable to react to anything where they are challenged because they have so many own regulatory uh, uh, issues, leave alone the discussions with labor manipulation and else. And, <clears throat> and if you create something good and you see the first steps that there are companies that come there uh, and get there, then in Europe alone you probably have like 10, 15 potential buyers that can spend a billion plus, which we had never before in our ecosystem. We were, if it came to European buyers, we were looking at like a handful of, of potential partners that could spend 100, 150 million, but now financial service would be a total step change to the entire game. Thanks, thanks everybody. We are changed today to share this moment with two of the, probably the best fund of the world, so we are happy with that. Thank you. Thank you.